a study, you gave so so you created this this milk with um, uh, labeled molecules, which I thought was really cool, like giving giving the the molecules to the cow. And, but you also had an infusion, which I of label molecules, which I think you were using to measure the MPS. Well, actually, the FSR. Could you talk a little bit about what is the FSR and how does that relate to MPS? And why did you need that separate infusion? Yeah, so yeah, the, the tracer methodology, so tracers just means you give something so you can trace a metabolic process. For example, how much of the ingested protein is digested, how much ends up in muscle tissue. Um, but that methodology is relatively complex, but the basic principle is if I take a muscle biopsy of you now, and I take one in four hours, I cannot say whether you grown or whether what rate muscle is building in your, in your body. Because before I see a couple of amino acids or muscle proteins, and after I see a couple of muscle proteins, and even if I have more muscle proteins in the second biopsy, that's simply because I took a bigger biopsy. So how, how, how am I going to get informed what's happening? So the trick we do, so the most yeah, basic technique is you infuse labeled amino acids. The amino acids are the building um, blocks of your muscle tissue. So in that first biopsy, which I take before the infusion, I would say, oh, Richard has zero of these labeled amino acids in his muscle tissue. Four hours later, now the infusion is going, I see, oh, Richard has 100 labeled amino acids. So then I know, oh, Richard is building 100 labeled amino acids in a four hour period. Now I have an indication of, let's call it growth. It's not necessarily growth, but of how fast amino acids are built into um, your body. Now we use an infusion for that because we want it to be, we want those building blocks to be available in your body at, a, at the same rate throughout the entire period. So then you just know it's a constant speed. Um, Otherwise, I would have like a picture here and a picture in New York. And then I know, well, it took him one day to go from um, Washington to New York. But I don't know if you did it in an hour and then chilled for 23 hours because I don't know your average speed. But by having that infusion, you have a nice average speed. So I just know how fast protein synthesis was, uh, just your average speed. Um, you do that with an infusion, but when you feed those same labeled amino acids in protein, that is not going to have that steady supply because immediately after ingestion, you have a lot and then slowly it will go back down. So therefore, you don't calculate muscle protein synthesis. You simply calculate how much of the ingested protein ended up, in this case, in Richard's muscle. And the basic trick there is the same before the ingestion of the protein. It was zero of those labeled amino acids. 12 hours later, there were 50 labeled amino acids. And then you know, okay, then you can well calculate 50 labeled amino acids that translate to 10% of the ingested protein, for example. Um, so th again, the main difference between the infusion and the dietary protein is one just says how fast is muscle building. Um, that building of muscle, it doesn't care where the building blocks are coming from. It can be that there were building blocks from your liver. Your liver got broken down, releases those amino acids, and those amino acids end up in your muscle a couple hours later. Um, the labels in the protein only look at how much of what you just consumed ends up in your muscle. So the one is exclusively what you just ate, how much of that ends up in your muscle. Uh, muscle protein synthesis from the infusion just looks either from what you just consumed or from your body, from breakdown from other tissues. So that's the difference between those two. Now, what is fractional synthetic rate? Um, if you look in the paper, you'll see with uh, the measurements of muscle protein synthesis, you'll see percentage per hour. Uh, that's the unit of fractional synthetic rate. It means that, um, for example, for muscle, if you're in a rested state and you have not consumed anything, 
the value is typically around 0.04% per hour. That means every hour, 0.4% of your muscle proteins are renewed. Mm -hmm. If we translate that value uh, to how long does it take before you have 100% renewal? That's about three months for humans, mm -hmm. which means that in three months, every protein in your muscle is completely broken apart and put back together. So it's the percentage of a tissue, in this case, muscle tissue, that gets renewed in a certain time frame, usually expressed in percentage per hour. I always like to back calculate it. How long does it take before the tissue is entirely renewed? Because I can wrap my head around it. So for muscle tissue, that is um, three months. If you don't do anything, if you exercise, you speed it up, for example. Um, but for some tissues, it's much higher. So for example, your gut tissue, uh, that can completely renew itself in one to two days, for example. So the muscle is, we think of muscle as a highly plastic tissue because you can either be a bodybuilder or you can be an endurance athlete with completely different muscle phenotypes. Uh, but when you compare it, for example, to some of your organs who can renew in like a matter of days, Muscle is kind of a slow tissue. Interesting. So is there a minimum amount of protein that you need to uh, instigate MPS, right? Or will like the liver just use it for something else? Yeah. Uh, no. So it's pretty linear. So any amount of protein will stimulate either muscle protein synthesis or just protein synthesis in uh, the body. Um, in practice, if you consume five grams of protein in a meal, it is going to stimulate muscle protein synthesis, but, uh, it's just going to be such a trivial amount that what are we talking about? But there's not some, um, threshold value that needs to be hit. Uh, now in the literature, you often hear the concept of leucine threshold. It's a pretty, yeah, well, let's call it a well-known uh, uh, definition that's been used. I think it's a very suboptimally defined concept because uh, a threshold value, I think you need a certain amount before something starts happening. But the way the leucine threshold is used in the literature is more like, oh, you need this amount of leucine to have the maximal effect. Uh, so I would more say it is like the leucine target or upper limit or the optimal leucine intake rather than a threshold. So it's not a light switch that goes on or off. Also, that concept of, oh, you need this much leucine in a meal is now kind of massively challenged by this paper um, <laughs> because uh, probably with more leucine, uh, you get the same concept that the signal of that leucine will just work for much longer because it's for hours and hours and hours, leucine is coming in and stimulating uh, the leucine threshold again. But mm -hmm. to simplify it, uh, any amount of protein will stimulate either muscle or whole body protein synthesis, and there's no clear threshold value. Um, maybe to briefly address your question, like will the liver steal the first amount of protein? Uh, so first your... Uh, intestinal tissue and then probably your liver is second in line to grab what it wants um, but it's not that um, so we call that the splenic tissues everything that has access to the protein before it comes in the circulation and then from there it can go to muscles so those splenic tissues they just seem to grab protein proportional to what's coming in so it's not that they say oh i need 10 grams. So the first 20 grams that passes by us, we take it. And then if there's more, then we'll release it to um, muscle tissue, for example. Now they just grab, I'll just throw out a random number, but it seems to be kind of accurate. About 50% of the incoming amino acids, they just keep to themselves and everything else they pass on. Whether you have a slow intake, sorry, a low intake or a higher intake, about 50% they seem to keep for themselves.
could you talk about protein breakdown? So um, like, I guess muscle growth is, is the difference between the two. Yeah. So what is muscle protein breakdown and what, um, what drives it? Yeah. So muscle protein synthesis is you have amino acids, you put them together, then you have a protein. And if that happens in muscle tissue, it's muscle protein synthesis. So protein breakdown is the opposite. You have a muscle protein, for example, a contractile protein that generates force. When amino acids get broken off from there, um, it's protein breakdown. And then what people often assume is if muscle protein synthesis is a good thing, that muscle protein breakdown must be a bad thing because they're opposing forces. Um, but that's not necessarily true. So the way I describe it, it gets back to what we discussed with that percentage per hour tissues are renewing. Um, you don't want, uh, well, think of it as renovation. Your muscle tissue is constantly being renewed. And the fact that there's protein breakdown allows the tissue to be renewed. I don't want to have proteins from 20 years ago in my muscle tissue that have 20 years of oxidative stress, physical activity causing damage. That just sounds like a disaster to happen that suddenly you will rupture your uh, muscle tissue. So the protein breakdown allows the tissue to renovate essentially. Um, what you see and like this is type of work you cannot do in humans. So my research is 100% in, in humans uh, just because it's the most practical. So it gets me the most excited. But of course, a lot of research you cannot do in humans. Uh, in animal models, if you create uh, uh, knockout models where muscle protein breakdown isn't working, you would think, or at least the bodybuilders always think, oh, these mice must be super big and super small because if they can't break as, as strong because if they can't break down protein they can only grow what you actually see is that those animals are smaller uh, weaker and die earlier so that just demonstrates at least some amount of protein breakdown is necessary otherwise you just accumulate bad proteins essentially so in general i would say people shouldn't think of muscle protein breakdown or protein breakdown in general as something bad it's just necessary for your body to adapt to whatever the circumstances are rather if you're afraid that you're going to lose protein just try to stimulate the synthesis side because that makes new proper proteins um i forgot the exact detail the exact question just what Which... protein breakdown is or how it's regulated so well, both. So, so I guess my follow-on question would be: So, is there anything we can do to? Well, is there anything that affects the speed of the breakdown? Yeah. Uh, yes, but it's a lot less uh, variable than protein synthesis. So, with protein synthesis, both exercise and protein ingestion strongly increase it, and it can go up by about three hundred percent, probably even more if you would use. Uh, high amounts of testosterone, like inject steroids, et cetera. But we see in our in our type of physiological normal studies that muscle protein synthesis can go up about threefold. Um, muscle protein breakdown can only go down by about 50%. And the main signal for that is insulin. So it can be protein itself or of course, carbohydrates, which will release uh, insulin, and then insulin inhibits muscle protein breakdown. Um, but you need very little insulin to have that maximum effect. Basically, anytime you're not fasted, like if you have 20 grams of protein, for example, nothing else with that meal, just a small protein shake, that releases enough insulin to have the maximum inhibition of muscle protein breakdown so from a nutrition type of view basically anytime you're not fast that you have done the maximum you can to reduce muscle protein breakdown and you probably don't want to reduce it anymore anyway because again it is a necessary thing in your body to stay uh, healthy and even strong um, what i think is going on there is that when you're fasted your body just typically needs glucose. So you have some amount of protein that's just broken down as energy. 
And when you're consuming anything, your body says like, okay, well, then I don't have to break down my tissues for energy because I have something coming in. So that's why I think you see that little bit of a reduction in protein breakdown. It's just not necessary to break something down because you have something coming into the body. Uh, the fact that it doesn't go down further if you consume more, I think is just because your body instinctively knows that it's an important process. It just doesn't make sense to shut it all the way down to zero. So that's from the nutrition side. Then you have exercise. Exercise uh, stimulates muscle protein breakdown. Well, we all know that exercise can make you uh, gain muscle mass, for example. So exercise stimulates muscle protein synthesis a lot more than muscle protein breakdown. Um, but again, the breakdown makes sense. If uh, an endurance athlete is starting to uh, go into bodybuilding, it kind of wants to change the composition of its muscle protein. Like the, the proteins that have been optimized to build a lot of mitochondria, it's like, no, we want more myofibular. So it makes sense that there is some protein breakdown because the tissue needs to remodel. So it's either remodeling for the challenge or simply uh, exercise damages tissues. So you need to remodel the damage. So again, it comes down to food and exercise, um, but both have a relatively small impact on it. It's not as variable as muscle protein synthesis. If you were doing a multi-day fast, like three days, or would that increase the muscle breakdown? Do you think yeah, that has not been studied like that. Mm -hmm. um, my guess is that it would increase a little bit after like 12, 24, maybe even 36 hours, just go up a little bit. Uh, because the longer you fast, like your liver glycogen will be depleted. So there, there's more need for glucose coming from for example, muscle tissues or any protein tissue. But then after that, my guess is it would go back down again as your body starting to realize that no glucose is going to come in and just slowly starts to shift to maybe more uh, ketogenic uh, adaptation that it kind of learns like, okay, let's give up on glucose. We're not getting that anymore. So I think there would be a small shift upwards and then back down uh, again. But even during that shift upwards, I don't think it would go up all that much so maybe it's important uh to add um as i said muscle protein breakdown doesn't change too much so uh, in the introduction i mentioned we do for example studies where people if you see someone in maastricht where we're from if you see someone walking especially a healthy younger adult if you see someone walking with a casted leg like entirely in stone essentially a leg um the chances are that he didn't break a leg, but that he's participating in one of our experiments. And what you see is they lose like easily like two kilograms of muscle tissue in one to two weeks, simply by not using that leg. So it's use it or lose it. Um, but when, if you look at the protein synthesis and protein breakdown in that leg muscle, uh, it's not that protein breakdown goes up during that period of massive muscle loss. It's simply that protein synthesis has gone down. So it's really protein synthesis that determines whether someone gains muscle mass, maintains muscle mass, or loses muscle mass, because protein breakdown just always stays in a very tight range. Mm 